Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland and Arsenal podcast. I'm Guna Gimli and tonight my guests are... First up, he's the fat man steering the good ship ABW. It's Danny the GFP. Hello, Danny. Oh, really cold. Oh, is it? Is the cold snap hit Cambridge? Oh, uh, yeah, it's not good. I'll just turn the Wi-Fi off on my phone by accident. You That's get, the kind of day I'm having. You get cold winter payments, don't you? Now you're, you're so old. Yeah, I do. So I can turn the heater on for an extra five minutes once a month. It's brilliant. I've always thought, right, that you should, um, you know, like in most modern day cars, they have heated seats. Yeah. Uh, or you put in them the Merc, on. My Merc's got heated seats. Makes, Makes you feel like you've, you pissed yourself. Wee. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I you always thought... a seat in the car. Put, put one in your wheelchair. Could do. You could but do. But then again, if, if I did wire it up to the mains, I'd probably have a little mistake accident and electrocute myself. Oh, that wouldn't be... Uh, It'd be like, oh, chuck- good. like chucking a toaster in the bath. Mm. Should we move on? Yeah, go on. Fantastic. Next up, it's our very own Canadian. What's that all about? It's OG. Hello, OG. How are you, fella? Long time no talk. Yeah, I know. I, I, I hear uh, a good bit of news for our listeners is uh, you'll come back to help Kate do the blogs. Yeah, Kate's been doing a great job. That that makes it sound like she hasn't been. She's been doing a good job, but uh, just in there to help and support it as best I can. She has been doing a, fast, a fantastic job. And now with both of you working on it, I think we'll, we'll be able to get blogs out. So I think that's a, a little nod to all the listeners to go and check out the Bergie blogs. Jeff, what's the um, Twitter at for the Bergie blogs? Uh, it is at the Bergie blogs. So exactly go, what that sounds. So go and give that a follow. Uh, we've got a, a great panel of people uh, chucking material our way. It's absolutely fantastic. Right then, we'll move on. Next up, touching cloth and touching our hearts. It's the Rev himself, Mr. Raj Patel. Hello, Rev. How was rehab, Ginger Bollock? It was all right. I've got the track marks out now, so... Excellent o- stuff. O- oil of Ole. You're back Ule. for good now. I'm, I just, who sung that? Take that? Yeah, I'm definitely oh, back for good. What a song that was. I love yeah. that song. I, I, I got five lipstick marks still on my coffee cup. Excellent stuff. Excellent. Wonderful. Looking forward to tonight. I am. I am. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're not talking about a win, but uh, but otherwise, it's better than talking about a draw. A is as good as a win when it comes to the North London derby. Yeah. So, exactly. Trust me, it's bragging rights. We've, we've re- retained bragging rights for a few more months. They're still not beating us this season, so fuck them. Especially right, after and we beat them at theirs. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Right. And Fit. finally, the man behind the numbers, Park Fife. It's Hello. Mr. Andrew Fife. Hello, Gimney. How the hell are you doing? Oh, you're making me moist with your with your deep tones. Well, it's so nice to hear your tones back on here again after months of Jason Davis's annoyingly Welsh. Oh, sorry, pal. I, I thought the, the people that had, I thought Don did a good job and 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 Jason did a very good job. The rest of you, fucking useless. But yeah, they did a an excellent job. I've had to come back and regain control. See. No, it's tried, good to have you back. Yeah, they tried to make me go to rehab, and fortunately, I said yes. Right then. Danny? Just before, before we get too carried away, let's not let's not give up on the uh, the bragging rights. Let's not get too carried away just yet. The uh, the Tottenham fans, fair play to them. They did kick the shit out of um, out of the uh, the toilets at the Emirates. So fair play to them. They've they've won they've won this one. And, uh, we'll see them in a few months. Uh, I think we should just go to their ground and, and bust some shit up. I think that's it. It's that's just... what they did feel at home in the toilets, though, didn't they? Most yeah. of them are homeless that live in toilets. Do you know what I think we should do? Oh. Torch their club shop. I think that's the perfect way just to get <laughs> no, back. No, then they'll claim on the insurance, won't they? Because they're moving. We'll be doing uh, them a favour. Well, we would be doing them a favour. Yeah. Anyway, over to you for scores and loan watch. Lovely, lovely. Right, here we go. Uh, Corporal Jenkinson started v Everton in the 1-1 draw. Didn't really didn't get sent off or score a goal, which makes a change for him. Um, Serge Nabry was not even on the bench for, Man, for in the Man United 2-0 win over West Brom. Um, apparently, because on the right-hand side for West Brom, you've got Sessignon, who has failed to score a single goal all season. But um, old, uh, what's his name, the bloke manager at West Brom, Stoke bloke, what's his name? Hughes. Pulis. Is it Tony Pulis, the West Brom manager? I'm glad I'm talking on my own here. Anyway, listeners, if that's right, just nod. Listeners are nodding. Good. Sorry, I, I was on. I was on mute. I've, I've kind of lost my mojo. I've been out of it too long. It is Mark Hughes. 
What, the West Brom manager? No, I, I thought you were talking about... Pulis, isn't Brom. Pulis, Pulis. That's it. Palace. He has said that he doesn't rate him, apparently, and I reckon he could come back in January because he's played 12 minutes of Premier League football since he's been there, and that's not what we wanted from him. Anyway, Wellington, no goals. Silva, well, he scored one ever. Um, didn't play in Bolton's 0-0 draw at home to Bristol City, so his time is almost up. Super John Terrell, continuing fantastic form for Birmingham. He scored and started in, in Birmingham City's 5-2 5-2 away win at Fulham which got the Fulham manager the sack um, Chupa Chupa Apcom and Zach Hayden both came on as subs as Hull had a 3-0 home win over Middlesbrough which is a bloody damn fine result because Middlesbrough one of the best teams one of the top 4 or 5 teams in the championship so well done to him Ashley Maitland Niles Conservative scored in midweek. I remember looking at that and that as Ipswich had a big win and he came on as a sub as Ipswich beat bottom of the league, Rotherham United five two away at the weekend. Um Damien Martinez started in goal again for Wolves. It looks like he is their number one choice. And in a 0-0 draw with Burnley, which isn't a bad result because Burnley are right up the top of the league. Uh, Wojciechowski um, started in Roma's 2-0 home win over arch-rivals Lazio, which is uh, another fantastic win for him. Jovino scored. Uh, he's one of the top goal scorers in Serie A at the moment. And Gideon Zelalem. Na, 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 na. Um, started in Rangers 4-0 home win against Aloha at the mighty Aloha Athletic and I think that all season they have only lost one league game so he is absolutely on fire there and expect him to be in the, the, the premiership with Rangers next season well whether he stay with them or not but he's definitely getting promoted so at least one Arsenal player is going to get a little bit of silverware this season um, then the only the women's season is over and the under-21s didn't play, and the under-18s played. We went to Norwich, and we beat them 3-2 with goals from Nikita, Fortune, and Dragomir. And if I look at the tables, the under-21s are currently third. And that's weird. They're four points behind Derby in first, but Derby played nine games, we've played five. So we've got four games in hand, which is 12 points, which is 27, so it'd be eight points clear. Write that down if you can. And the under-18s are fourth in their division, eight points behind Chelsea, so you might as well give up in that league because they've probably got a million players. And if you're any good, they'll just go and buy you for a few more million quid. There you go. All done. Woof. Did you say about the ladies winning some silverware? Oh, yeah. They won the, uh, they won the FA Cup or the League Cup again. But that was... No, wasn't it the, the European, the ladies' European Cup or something like that? Is it? Yeah. That's the first I've heard of that. Well, go uh, Arsenal ladies have got a Twitter page. Someone go and have a look it up. And, and, and... How long ago did they win this? Results? About last know. week. Last week, I think. Um, they won on the 1st of November. What's this? The WSL. They won 3 0. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, well, the... It's the Women's Super League. Is it Super League? Some um, shit like that. The Continental Cup, we won 3 1. Not having any, anyone accuse us of being sexist on this show. Uh, the Gunners, fifth successful final after goal. Oh, right. So this was on the, the 11th of October, <laughs> which is a month ago. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the other one, Jace and Dom, didn't want the results, did they? No, they, they but I, I, them. Yeah. it's a fundamental part of this show, and I'm sure the listeners enjoy it. Yeah, so they uh, they beat Birmingham City a month ago, 3-1 in the final, with goals from Correda, Rueda, Carter and Scott. So, yeah, so it's just going to have a quick read off the Arsenal site here. And it says, Arsenal ladies reached their fifth consecutive Continental Cup final with a 3-1 win against Birmingham City on Sunday. The Gunners secured second place, secured their place with goals from them. Uh, what is this bloody cup thing. Oh, if Ava's listening to this, she's going to find out where I live and murder me. Continental Cup. It was played yeah. in England. I don't know. Anyway, I should have looked at that, but it's been so long since I've had to look at the results. I can luckily remember where they are, let alone Sh- what's going on. Shall we move on? Go on then. Wonderful. Uh, so it's just the one game to discuss this week, and uh, what a game. Fair's analysis on that draw with the shit up the road. Uh, OG. Uh, thank you, sir. What a game. Um, I wasn't sure going into this game how we were going to react after the Munich game last week, midweek, um, especially playing away uh, against probably what you, what is uh, Europe's one of Europe's best teams and taking an absolute walloping. You know, in the past, uh, we've set about games like that where we've taken a big beating to sort of consolidate our losses and kind of go for the draw. Uh, and the game didn't start like that at all. I remember thinking, wow, this is a bit of a ding dong. We've got two defensively sound teams with good defensive records in the league. Um, and, and it started off in the first five minutes back and forth. Uh, t- you know, there's a lot of open space on the field. And slowly that closed down and Spurs uh, 
they got into a pressing game and they really put pressure on um, Coquelin and, and Santi Cazola. And as much as I like Cazola, he, he just had a lot of trouble with two players on him all the time. And, you know, when a team like that, that's young and fit and, and Pochettino has done that with Spurs, they've got a team there that is, um, it was doing three a days in the summer. They're, they're the youngest team, youngest average age, age in the league. Um, they had a midweek game. It was Anderlecht at home. It's a little different than playing against Bayern Munich. Uh, they really got on the gas pedal. And when that happens, when they start pressing our midfield, um, we've got to spread the ball wide. We've got to move it a lot quicker than what we were doing. We looked a bit ponderous on the ball. And we've got to win the individual battles in the midfield in terms of uh, breaking free. And unfortunately for Santi, I don't know, he, it sounded like he, he was talking about being dizzy. He got subbed at half. He just looked like he was under, under, under pressure for a, a good portion of that half. Um, and, and they, they look like they were, you know, the game sort of devolved into sort of this foully pressing. No one could really keep hold of the ball. Um, no one could take possession for long periods. And, and as the half wore on, of course, um, they got their goal. Uh, it, it looked like it was, uh, Kajilny who missed the step as, as pair went to, went to the ball rather than, uh, watching Kane zip in behind him and he finished well. And that's all I really want to say about him. Um, and, and we never really got going that half. We, we never kind of played, um, you know, at, at our top, top ability that we're able to play at. And so we finished the half at one, one, nothing. Um, I, I think when we came out from, from halftime, I was hoping for a bit of a reaction and it looked like for a good period there that that Spurs were on top. I, you know, you couldn't see where a goal would come from. Um, of course, Santi was subbed at the half, and I thought that was a good sub. Um, uh, and, and but we just couldn't get a hold of the ball, and we were conceding a lot of possession. We weren't putting any pressure on them at all. And it, again, it looked like a bit of a hangover, maybe from Munich. I'm not sure, but. You know, you don't want to see that. I understand why you see that, but you don't want to see that in the North London Derby. You want players that are out there and fighting, fighting for every ball. Um, and then as the as the half wore on, we started to get back into the game. We had chances. We, uh, you know, Giroud was was guilty of missing a couple great chances. That header uh, to the back post, I thought it was in from from how I was watching it, and of course, it didn't end in the back of the net. Um, but you could sort of get the sense, this feeling that all of a sudden the game was turning. Um, and we made a couple subs. Gibbs comes on onto the pitch uh, at left mid, um, and and again we were coming into the game, and all of a sudden this wonderful assist from Mesut Ozil, who I'm sure we'll come on to in in a second. Uh, and I said, made a comment at the time. You know, it was such a good ball at the back post. Gibbs could not not miss it. You know what I mean? He just mm. he just uh, he got on it, and 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 the stadium erupted. You could hear it through the through the screen. Um, and and it just shows you that what a what a game of fine margins when uh, that goal really just lifted the players, and we were on top, and we had good chances. And I wanted to point out one. You know, we talk a lot about scoring goals, um, but at the other end. What a save by Petr Cech to keep us in that game. We, you know, we we talk about him a lot every week. We talk about him in blogs. He's been a fantastic signing, and a, and a, just a massive save near the end of the game. Um, and it, in the end, honors even. Uh, I think you know, when looking back at it, uh, we weren't at our best, um, and I think Spurs probably were a lot closer to their best than than we were. Uh, so to take points, uh, take a point there, I think is a good point. Um, I'm disappointed because if you look at the chances we got, we certainly had the half chances to actually put that game away and take all three points. Uh, you never want to, you never want to drop points to Spurs, but at the same time, I think that's going to be a good point over the course of the season. Um, Spurs have already beaten some, some other teams. And I think they're going to, they're going to, with their pressure, their, their pressure style, their high press and, and their youth and their fitness, they're going to cause some teams some problems. So I think at the end of the day, that, that was a good point. And, um, I think, you know, we just got to look forward to, to, uh, uh, West Brom in a, in a couple of weeks. Mm. Some very good points there. So we'll try and uh, boil that down then and, and, and break it apart. Um, I'll go to Andrew next. Uh, it was a very slow start, Andrew, wasn't it? And uh, to be fair, they, they could have had the game wrapped up in the first half, albeit for Petr Cech. He made some fantastic saves. Um, I remember when we signed him, there was... I can't remember which Chelsea player it was, but he said that Petr Cech would probably save us around 15 points. Well, Tom I think... Perry. Uh, yeah, John Terry. You're very right with that one. I think it was actually. And he had three three direct saves yesterday. Yes. The other day. Um, but he was right, wasn't he, Andrew? Um, if not for Petr Cech, we probably would have lost the game. 
No, I think that's a, a very fair point. Uh, Pia Cech's been, uh, you know, an incredible signing for us uh, since since he joined, and I think we, you know, we were well, we were praising him uh, massively on the on the pod only a couple of weeks ago when I was on with Mark and Raj, you know, saying about how you know a, a good goalkeeper might not necessarily win you the game, but he will certainly keep you in it long enough, you know, for you then to go on to win it. You know, unfortunately we didn't, and Spurs, you know, the, the reaction at work, you know, I, I work in a, a big financial organisation in London, and it's pretty much dominated between Spurs and Arsenal fans on the floor. You know, you could certainly tell just from the reaction after the game that the Spurs fans were certainly the ones that felt the most aggrieved at only getting the point than us. Um, you know, they p- people came up to me saying they've never seen Spurs batter Arsenal the way they did before. Well, they'd never seen a Spurs team so, you know, consistently in control of a North London derby. And it was telling just how much how much more superior Spurs were. Not necessarily in the last five, ten minutes, because it did feel to me as though it, it was quite a strange one for me. Arsenal had the more the more uh, threatening opportunities of the of the two, especially, you know, the last few minutes, you know, especially Giroud's four headers. You know, one you know, why can't he just bury one of them? Christ. But Spurs always looked in control, that they were the more organised, I'd say, of the two teams. I think OJ, uh, Jeff, you know, hammered home the point with that. Their, their pressing game was fantastic. Um, and I think we can't really point to, you know, t- being tired. You know, Spurs, have been, that was their third competitive game in, in, in six days. You know, and yet they, they looked fresher than us. They were, you know, they were first to, you know, Dele Alli was first to most balls. They were, they were superior in, in their desire to win the game. You know, just look at the second half. We were an absolute shambles at the back. We were in sixes and sevens between Mertesacker and Debushi and Koscielny playing and Coquelin as well. We're all at fault for just playing reckless passes. And, and Spurs were all were on top of us throughout the game. You know, forced it, mate. You know, they were making us um, create unforced errors. They were, you know, threatening us. They were really pushing us high up the field. And that's kind of what we've seen teams like Dortmund do to us in recent years, and, and they've come to Demers and got success. So I think one thing we need to look at as a team is how do we, you know, how do we defend better uh, against teams that press us high? Because it, we certainly do leave ourselves exposed. And you know, we're, we're lucky that Czech, um, you know, has kept us in this game. And it's not the first time he's he's made wonder saves that have, that have given us these points. And you know, you know, cap to the hat, uh, tip your hat to Arsene Wenger for signing him. But you know, we. As Arsenal, we shouldn't be relying on the goalkeeper, um, and, and yeah, but um, and luckily we had him that day. Mm, very true. And uh, Rev, we'll come to you next. Now, if someone would have told you, um, had you not watched the game, that Arsenal had gone a goal down and their three subs would have been Gibbs, Flamini and Arteta, um, you probably would have said that we'd have gone on to lose the game, would you not? So... What does a point mean for you? Because you said before we started recording that anything than a loss is fantastic. Well, I mean, we said it a few times over the last, you know, two years. When it comes to the North London derby, you just don't want to lose against the opposition. Um, and I think that that's the same for Spurs fans as well. You know, um, it's one of those days where you, you get up and you, you, you've, you've got that pre-NLD nerves 24 hours before and you're stressed out on the day and you go down and... There's a subdued atmosphere inside and outside the stadium. Um, you know, the first the first five minutes, there was a lot of noise and stuff. But once Tottenham started pressing and started controlling the game, and they did that for long swathes of the game, it was dead silent. It was like you know, it was like a library. And then after we'd equalised, then it was just deafening, and we thought we'd you know might win the, get that second goal and win the game. But um, you know, I mean, the the the, the Tottenham manager Pochettino would probably gone away unhappy that he didn't get the win and Arsene Wenger and ourselves have probably gone away thanking God that we did get a draw you know uh, there was a chance that Tottenham would score a second goal before we'd equalised so all in all you know I'll take that point we looked absolutely knackered well, personally speaking uh, on Sunday he looked tired but for, for me um, Rev I was just jump in there uh, yeah, yeah. Lynn looked like he was absolutely hanging in his out of his ass for the in, even in the first 20 minutes he just looked knackered we, there's no, you know, we've got a bench, we've got some decent players on the bench, but they're not players that you probably rely on to try and win the Premier League or win a competition and stuff. Our first 11 is absolutely superb, uh, but most of them are, or half of them are, elite, are are injured at the moment. So, you know, the, these got, these got players, are for, the, the remaining first 11 players are playing every game. And they just they're just getting more and more tired, and that's that's my fear uh, for the for the season is is we've got the quality when they're all fit to actually make a challenge for the Premier League and possibly even win it. 
Um, but with all these injuries now, um, and you've got players rotating in who probably wouldn't start in your first eleven anyway, uh, we've just got to. We might struggle now a little bit, but we've just got to just back the team now. All the fans have got to just support the team and just try and push them through these next few games over the next three or four weeks. But I, I think also as well, we've got um, an international break coming up at just the right time. That that's a fortnight now until our next game, I believe. Um, I think we'll see the likes of Walcott and Chamberlain back after the break and Ramsey. Um, so... Do you believe that? Do you believe that, Kim? Do you believe what the clubs say? I, 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 I'm, I'm not being negative. I'm just going to say I'll, I'll, I'll wait and see see what happens. And also, um, I think Dom uh, sent a message to us saying that some of these—is it muscle injuries that they've got? Um, yeah. It'll take it'll take time for them to come back. That's what Dom says, and I believe him. So if they do start again, they're not 100. percent And uh, we've had lots of examples in recent history where players have come back and got injured again. So there's there's some big decisions got to be made because um, yeah. don't rush them back in. You know, Rambo Rambo could get injured again within one game because um, it's happened to him in the past. So. I think we've got to be careful. It's going to be very interesting on, on how we manage the players over the next uh, probably a month or so. Um, but I'm just crossing fingers at the moment because we're in a great position, uh, but we are kind of running out of, of fit players one yeah. by one. Well, we certainly are. Um, really? Yes. So that, that message that Dom gave us, he asked us to read it out if we discuss it. Shall yeah, go on. Yeah, 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 he says, if you discuss injuries, can you make a point for me? Soft tissue injuries are still at a high risk for the first three to four games after returning. So when Theo, Ox and Ramsey come back, it takes a few weeks to get up to speed and be in the clear. It's not a matter of saying, well, they are now back, so they are 100% now. Mm. And then he says, no drama. But I think for, for, for me, and, and Danny, you've just put the stat up there in the box, um, and I'll read what you put there. Oh, well, that uh, Bellerin one. Yeah. Read out who it's from as well, in case it's wrong. I do, well, I, I do actually think that uh, out of all the players out, he's one of the ones we miss the most. I mean, especially down that right-hand side, there's no real fluidity. For me, Debussy isn't a patch on what, what he used to be, and uh, if the chance comes to offload him, uh, in January, uh, I don't think that that would be bad as long as we have sufficient cover. Loan um, to Roma is the rumor. Yes. Uh, have, but, have we got? Have we got sufficient cover, Gimli? Um, we haven't got. We haven't got sufficient cover. I don't think we have. No. no but, so um, we, we can't get. We can't afford to get rid of anyone at this moment in time. Not even in January. I can't. Although Debussy, can... although I hear Debussy is now starting to think about the Euros. I think. Um, he, you know, yeah. I'm quite disappointed in Debussy, actually. He came out in the summer and made it clear he wasn't happy when he was benched for Bayerin for the Community Shield final, uh, or the Charity Shield, and he's and, and he's been vocal in the press again this past week. And you think, a guy, he, you know, the guy, he's, he's an experienced player now, he should just get his head down and work hard to get into the team, if that's his concern, or take this kind of issue offline with his agent. But I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed with his attitude and his kind of, and his per, taking his personal gripe out on Arsenal. Mm. I mean, it is a, a petulant attitude. I think he said something like that he, he wanted to play in the Euros and that was at the back of his mind and maybe he would move on uh, with with the possibility of playing in the Euros in mind. But the stats that have been put up here and it's uh, by at football underscore tweet um, and they've put Arsenal without Hector Bayer in this season. Uh, we played six, won one, drawn one, lost four, scored five, conceded 14. Um, particularly against Swansea, I think the thing that we, I could see with him, he's the one that gets back, clears the ball off the line. Um, he's developed into a, a very good little defender. Um, and I, I think mostly with him as well, we, we miss his attacking prowess as well. Uh, like I said, no fluidity down that right side, especially um, not having the ox and having to play Joel Campbell is kind of hit us doubly hard. But uh, Danny, uh, I'll come to you. And uh, another interesting topic, as I just touched on, Joel Campbell there. Um, and I put a poll out after the Tottenham game where I actually said that I didn't think he had too bad a game. Um, you know, I... I I've been quite critical of him when he's played the season. I don't think he's looked, you know, a, a patch of the player that he did do at the World Cup. Um, maybe we should have cashed in, you know, him in in the summer. I think there were rumours that we were going to get around nine million for him. Um, but hey ho, uh, Danny, your your thoughts on Joel Campbell? Because I've got the poll here, and the question was, 
does Joel Campbell have a future at Arsenal? And 68% of the people said no. And that was at last look this afternoon that had about 668. Um, so what's your thoughts on Joel Campbell? He's the, the best striker player for Costa Rica and he should be treated as such. He, is, he shouldn't be a third choice right right winger when he is the first choice forward, whether that be uh, an out-and-out striker, whether it be just a forward for Costa Rica. And he knows that and he knows that he had a great spell with Olympiacos and he was um, scored that goal against Man United. And he's only getting into the game into um, a game now because we've got no other players to play on the right-hand side. He knows he's virtually on the verge of a move to, I think it was Galatasaray or someone like that in the summer. And it was called off at the last moment when we realised that I think there was someone Wenger wanted to buy that he couldn't buy. And so we didn't let him go. And it's never going to work out, is it? When you're young and like that, you don't want to be sitting on the bench every time and only getting a game if you're third choice. And it's, it's not good enough for a player like him. And he has shown glimpses... Like in the Swansea match, he got an, an opta rating of 8.64 and scored a goal. Now, that's what he can do when he's had virtually no games all season. I mean, that was only his uh, um, 2001, 2, 3, fourth game. He played against Sheffield Wednesday in the League Cup, but that didn't really count because that was rubbish. So, uh, yeah, it's only his, his fourth or fifth game of the season. He's a really, really good player, but I think a lot of it is attitude and a lot of it is, well, they don't want me, why should I bother? And a lot of players like Coquelin took that and grabbed it and made that place his own within within minutes of, of getting that opportunity. And I don't think Joel's going to do it because I don't think Wenger rates him. And I think he'll be maybe off uh, in in the summer, maybe even in January, if we can bring somebody else in and we'll get good money for him. It's a shame because we all remember in the World Cup, he was fantastic for Costa Rica, who was one of the shining lights of the World Cup. But I don't think his future is with, with us, whether it be his fault, Wenger's fault, positional fault or or any other fault, I just, I just think it's destined not to work out. And it is a shame, because I think he's a decent player. Mm. Is, there, is there anybody else that's got a thought on uh, Joel Campbell? Is there anybody else that wants him moved on? Not good enough? I, I don't mind keeping faith in him a little bit longer. He's just, he, hasn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't get much game time. He has recently. And he, he wasn't too bad on Sunday. And he, you know, he, had, he had a shot, a pretty good shot, which um, uh, Loris palmed away. Uh, I thought the first half he was probably our brightest player. In yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd give him a bit more time, you know. I mean, I've, I've very rarely written off players very quickly. The only, there's only two players I've, I've written off in Arsenal history, in my history with Arsenal, and that's um, Sonogo, Sonogo and Alberto Mendes, if you remember him. Oh. Uh, but, uh, I'd, yeah, just, you know, maybe I'm a bit, getting soft in my old age, but maybe give him a bit, bit more time. But, I mean, if he's itching to go and you, you get nine million for him, then I, I'd think Arsenal would probably say yes to that. I, I right. think there was there was a lot of talk with Palermo, wasn't there, in the summer? Palermo were interested in uh, they were going to spend some of the money they got from uh, the Dabala sale. Um, well, apparently, apparently we wanted six million from Mehing in the summer, and, and no one no one club offered us six million outright, which we were looking for. But I just don't think he plays with the intensity you need to have in in the Premier League. I know I know you were talking, Danny, there about his performances in the World Cup. But he got knackered after like 65, 70 minutes in the World Cup in most games. He was going off with cramp, wasn't he? he? I think there was one game where they couldn't take him off because they'd used all their subs and he was effectively just a token up front, stood there just doing nothing. around. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think he has the fitness, the energy, the intensity levels. Not, and not just the physical intensity, but even the mental intensity. He doesn't play at the same tempo as Arsenal. You know, he's got, especially I think when Bayer is there, you've got players overlapping him. And he's he's too busy trying to beat the man with his left foot. There's times where he, you know he's just so one one footed. Yeah, and I know don't get me wrong. Some of our best players have been you know very one footed. But I'm not. I mean, I don't want to write him off because I and I would like to see him. But I'm not convinced he's going to make it at Arsenal. I think yeah. for the way the the style and the system we play, having a winger who slows down the game so much because he's so focused on trying to beat someone with his left foot off the right. He reminds me a bit of and you know Townsend at Tottenham. He he can beat players, but I'm not convinced by his end product, and I'm not convinced that he'll play to the the pace and the speed that Arsenal and Arsene Wenger certainly wants us to be at. And I, I think he's just going to be marginalised when when players like Chamberlain and Ramsey come back into the fold. Hmm. It's an it's an odd position for us to be in because as as Raj correctly pointed out, we can't afford to lose anybody right now. Uh, so if an interesting offer comes around in, in January for him, because I, I tend to be with you, Fife. I I I, I think that um, he's very one footed. His you know it. <laughs> the, his positioning uh, at times is a little bit questionable, and sometimes he just looks outright tired on the pitch, which is is strange. 
um, for, for a top, top, top quality athlete. Uh, but I'm not ready to write them off as well. But at the same time, you know, if an interesting offer comes through in, in January, do you sell? Do you sell Joel Campbell? I mean, um, knowing that we've still got a lot of uh, a strong run of games, if we're in this position where we are right now, where we're, you know, in the top three, um, we, we, you know, do you sell a, a guy who potentially can, can at least contribute or come off the bench and, and at least hold down the right side for us? I don't think you can sell. I don't think you can sell anyone in January because you don't know what's going to happen between February and May. And he is, he is, as is, you're right, he is making a contribution, isn't he? And, um, you just, I mean, our injury situation is such that you just don't know what's going to happen in the next few months. And I, I don't trust, uh, we, I, I think we've got a curse when it comes to injuries and I just think it will carry on for, for a while longer. And getting rid of players in general will be a huge mistake. Huge mm. mistake. Yeah, I, th- I think I probably agree. Is it just a curse? Yeah, I think it is a curse. I don't want to blame anyone. I don't want to blame Shad Forsyth or the coaching staff. It just seems to happen, doesn't it? We've seen most of these games with our eyes now and I just don't know. It, happen, it happens every year at the same time in kind of October, November. See that, and I agree with you on that. And that's the thing that I find frustrating. I, I tell you, I tell you, the big reason is that, is that it's, we've got such a lightweight squad, squad that they are being overplayed. We we can't afford to rotate when when everyone's fit because you're, you're, you're not putting in. You know, you can't rotate Ramsey out and put in Flamini. They're not. They're not in the same league that our reserves are our bench that compared to the first eleven. And that kind of highlights the point for me as well, the lack of spending. I mean, it doesn't matter what your what your view is on the injuries. You know, It doesn't matter whether you think it's you know an act of God, whether you think it's the pitch, whether you think it's Wenger, whether you think it's you know just some hoodoo doll on us. The, the, the fact of the matter is, every single year, regardless, we get these huge swathes of injuries that hit us, and we are completely deplete. And you can and people say every summer, well, you can't you can't say that's going to happen next year. You can't say that's going to happen next year. We don't have to spend. You don't know there's going to be injuries. But as an Arsenal fan, we do. We know that we're going to top the injury league every season, regardless of what we do, who we bring in. It just happens. And yet we've got £88 million on, in our transfer budget, which we, we're not spending. And yet there's such a disparity, as you mentioned, there, in the quality between the first 11 and then some of the, some of the second string players. You know, we make five or six changes against Zagreb and we lose. We make you know, a few changes to Sheffield Wednesday and we lose. And yeah, and then we're playing with you know we're not, we haven't got Bayer in and we haven't got Ramsey against Spurs and you get Chamberlain either and and we're getting bad at home to Spurs and yet the alternative you know if Giroud got injured on the weekend we didn't have a striker we could bring on off the bench we had Iwobi who was our you know Iwobi who he wasn't even in the fold last season and yet he's now our our attacking option or Gibbs was our attacking option if, if Giroud got injured you know that's incredible when you got eighty eight million pounds in the bank. And we've got fans on, on Twitter and, and, and on social media saying, no, we're Arsenal. We should only be buying world-class players. We can only buy players that, that are better than what we've got. Well, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. Because we know we're going to get these injuries. You know, and it, it, if the alternative is losing to games against you know, Sheffield Wednesday or Zagreb because we make a couple of changes, then it's, it's incredu- I'm incredulous at that, kind of that train of thought. And, and, it's the, and it's this time of the season which highlights just how... you know the need for us to be spending more in the, in, in, I'm taking tra- chances on players like Obin Yang, um, mm. you know, and, and, and that sort of player, um, we, you know, the, the whole trying out the line that we should only be buying world class. It's this time of the season, which highlights what a tosh that is. We need to be improving that, you know, the core squad and making sure that there's, su- there's a le- there's less difference in the quality between the A's and the B team players. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, we saw the likes of, De- you know, Debussy had an all right game, but he's just lost his pace now. I'm not convinced about Campbell. And, and apart from that, you know, it's, it's not looking great as soon as you uh, start to scratch the surface after, after the, uh, the first 11. And, uh, and that's yeah. something that really concerns me. I mean, the standard of quality on that bench on Sunday, I said it when I saw the team line up and the bench was, it was shocking, to be quite honest. Uh, you, you'd think that that was a bench that Arsenal would have put out three or four years ago where there's just dead wood on it, really. Um, Jeff, I know that you've got something to say on this, so far away. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. You look at every season we get injured, and it should be our job to to mitigate against that risk. But we'll always, 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 always get injuries. It's it's just um, it's just the way we play. And I, I would actually argue and say that there's other teams. I mean, uh, if we want to talk about injuries, I mean, look at look at a team like Bournemouth who can't afford to uh, bump up their bench. I mean, they're 
their season looks all, all but lost since they've lost uh, Callum Wilson there to, to a significant injury. Um, but, it, you know, with a, t- a team of our resources, we should be mitigating against that risk. And, you know, the flip side is you look at a team like City who have who've gone periods without Aguero, without Silva and without company this season. Um, and they've had a guy like De Bruyne come in. I mean, obviously, they spent a lot of money on De Bruyne. They had Sterling come in. Um, but So, you know, there's got to be some sort of balance there because, you know, when you look at a season, this is a marathon. For me, this is why the Premier League is the best trophy for us. It's not the Champions League. It's not the FA Cup. It's not the Milk Cup. It, it is. It's not the Makita Cup, Danny. I know what you're thinking. Uh, it it, it really is the Premier that. League. I know you were. It, and it's because it's, it's a marathon. It's 38 games long. It goes from August to May. Um, and truly, when you win the Premier League, you can say you are the best team. And it's because um, you've mitigated against the risks of injury. You've got the rubber. You've got the bounce of the ball in games. Um, you've had, uh, you know, the mental quality to get through games, you know, uh, at Stoke on a Wednesday night in November. Um, and, that, and that's really what it is. And so... The fact that we we don't have that squad depth or we don't seemingly have that squad depth, sometimes I look at that and I say, you know, I sometimes think that maybe Arson or, or the club do think they have that squad depth and they, they kind of get turned over in these games or, or they get found out. And sometimes I think, you know, Arson's known for putting his faith in players. I think sometimes um, this is what happens, you know, putting his faith in, in Mikel Arteta, for example, uh, to come in and, and do a job and, uh, you know, potentially could play, you know, 10 or 15 games this year if, if needed. Um, to me, that's, that's, a, that's a recipe for disaster for a team that's chasing, chasing the title or wants to go for the title. Um, you know, the flip side of it is there's a, you know, you, you talk about getting the bounce of the ball or, or the rub of the green or, you know, getting, those, getting through those defining moments in a season. Um, we're, a, we're an offside call away from being top of the table right now in Aaron Ramsey against Liverpool. Uh, you know, bad officiating at Chelsea. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it. So, so we're we're in the mix, um, and I think that's that's hopeful. But again, you know, I think Fife, you said it. November this time of year, it, it tends to hurt us. And so, you, fingers crossed. Let's see if we can get through it and get to the Christmas period and and be on top still or be within reach in January. Uh, but I think the one thing that we've seen this year as well is that games that we would have thrown away previous years, we've managed to get something out of. I think um, this game last year, we'd have lost it the way the way we were playing. You, I mean, you've got to analyse it from the situation. You can't go back in the summer and, and spend the money that we've got. You've got to go with what you've got and support what you've got. Um, however, you can't turn around and say that when you're 1-0 down to Tottenham and the, the three substitutes you're making are two defensive midfielders and a left-back, that that is acceptable, you know, to go forward. Um, or for me, it isn't anyway. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think the the way it is now is we would have lost against Tottenham and we, we're grounding out results. You know, if Man United had the result against Tottenham that we had, people would have said, oh, you know, they're winning ugly. Well, I know it wasn't a win, but you know, do you know what I mean? They're, they're kind of grinding out results. They got the point rather than, than chucking it away or, or just completely collapsing. Um, so I think that's one positive that you can say this season. Personally, for me, I would have said, uh, at 1-0 down, if we could have gone on to win that game, I would have started to believe that we could have a, uh, maintained a title challenge this season. Um, personally, for me, I, you know, I do think we are good enough, as the Revs already pointed out in this podcast. Our first 11 um, can, you know, can beat anyone on their day. Um, Bayern Munich, for instance. Um, but yes, uh, we'll move on then. Um, and Jeff, I want to come back to you and do an Ozil watch. Now, uh, those that have been a long time listener to this podcast will remember that we used to do Ozil watch every single week. Um, but after that ball against Tottenham, uh, I bought it back for this week. So Jeff hit us with an Ozil watch, please. Yeah, you bet. Uh, hopped on who scored.com and, uh, checked out some of the stats. He had seven key passes, 81 and a half percent pass accuracy over 80 touches. He was who scored.com's man of the match, not Dele Alpe or Dembele or Harry Kane or anyone like that, uh, with a rating of 8.2. Interestingly, of their top five players on the pitch, the fifth one was Debushi. So there's, I know it's not Debushi watch, but, uh, thought that was interesting. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, there's been a lot made of his assist record that he got um, six in six consecutive games. Um, that is uh, a Premier League record. He's tied, of course, with 
uh, that snake up at Chelsea, um, who did, he, he had two assists for Arsenal on his way out, and then he had four for Chelsea when he came in. Ours, of course, have been natural within a season six and six. He's also got 10 assists now in 11 games. He hasn't played all 12 in the league. I think he missed, I want to say Sunderland. Um, and, uh, and he leads all five European top leagues. Um, in, in terms of assists this year, uh, with 10, the next closest is seven. So he is, is blowing it away. The conversation now is really starting with him and his assist record is, is he going to be able to catch Thierry's, uh, one season assist, uh, marker of 20? Um, and you know, by all, by all, all signs right now, I would say, yeah, he, he certainly looks like a good bet on that. Um, I'd also like to say that he leads Europe in terms of key passes. So um, some people want to know the difference between key passes and chances created. Chances and created is a, is a, a summation of assists and key passes. Assists are passes that lead to a shot on goal that result in a goal. Key pass is uh, a pass that leads to a shot and a goal that does not result in a goal. And he has 44 key passes this season. Again, leads all of Europe's top five leagues. So he is he's having a great season so far. Um, and he was full value for the money on the weekend for sure. That assist for Gibbs' goal was was on a platter. It was it was wonderful. Mm. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think this season um, he's actually starting to get the credit he deserves, um, not just from journalists, but actually a large segment of our fans. Because for some reason, our fans get awfully balandish. And if a player doesn't perform in their first season or their second season, you know, oh, you've got to sell him. I, I do actually remember there were a lot of our fans calling for us to sell Mesa Ozil. But uh, he's just this season, he's just been on a different level. Um, and, and we're truly, truly honoured to have him in our team. Um, so we'll start to wrap this up in terms of the Tottenham game. Um, is there anything else anybody wanted to talk about? I know, Raj, you wanted to talk a little bit about the atmosphere, didn't you? No, not really. It's, it's, I mean, uh, the, the North London derby is, is, a lot, is a, an exception in some ways, and you can't really compare that with, with the atmosphere and stuff but it was dead quiet Andrew wasn't it I mean that's 25 minutes in the second half when Spurs were all over us it was like you could hear a pin drop it was that quiet but uh, uh, on the flip side after we'd equalized those last 15-20 minutes it was ear splitting and it was very exciting as a fan to be there when, when that was happening but um, yeah it wasn't it wasn't that great but um, the last few minutes were memorable what do you reckon Andrew? I completely agree, and it was almost it reminded me that we were quite similar against Bayern Munich. We had when you know with the you know during the period when Bayern were kind of dominating the game, yeah, and the yeah. Arsenal end was you know silent. But then when we scored the two goals, electric, and it, it was just exactly the same in the weekend. You can never really predict the atmosphere at North London derbies, as you, I think you said at the start of the pod, Raj. You know, it's one of those where as an Arsenal fan or a Tottenham fan, you know, before you you, you don't mind taking a draw so much just because you don't want to lose and you're so tense. And when Spurs were on top of us and were the better side, you, you know, as you said perfectly, you could hear it. You could hear a pin drop. You know, when there's been games when we're winning against Spurs at home, you know, it's one. Of, you know, it doesn't matter what minute it is, it's, it's the best atmosphere you've ever seen. So yeah, it wasn't a great atmosphere on the weekend. Um, you know, the first few minutes were great. Uh, the, the 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 Remembrance Day um, the Remembrance Day uh, celebrations were fantastic and well adhered to by both sets of fans. And in the, in the last 10 minutes, we were excellent. But apart from that, it, it was a very uh, shaky atmosphere, very nervous. The, the silence actually reminded me of uh, the first set of Barcelona games we played about four or five years ago. It was the tool. And I think in the first 15 minutes, Barcelona played that tippy-tappy football all around our box. Had three or four shots, which, uh, which they missed. And I think that, it, was, it was exactly the same as that. But it, the difference was that on Sunday, we were fearful. And with that Barcelona game, we were just awestruck by the, by the way they were playing football that night. And uh, we were just absorbed in how, how they were playing and passing and stuff. And that, that, there was that sign as well. But it was. It was uh, it's weird when, when you have 60,000, well, you know, 55 or 58,000 fans just completely silent. And just that one little pocket of fans in the corner making a lot of noise and stuff like that. It was um, a strange feeling. I did look around the crowd. And they were all the same. They were just, just sat there dumbstruck. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything else anybody wants to touch on before we move to Danny and some Twitter questions? What about about the game? Yes. Yeah, go on. Yeah, just just very very annoyed. I was I was screaming a lot at the telly because it was just really annoying that that yet again it seems to be I actually was the only person who predicted Kane to score the first goal. 
And uh, I that's thought, nothing yeah. to brag about. Yeah, I know, but that just it's just the sums up. I think our luck against the <laughs> against that lot when when it's really really important. I really don't think that a lot of the players really get it. Mertesacker might as well have been facing the wrong direction with a bag on his head most of the game. It was an absolute liability. I thought Debucci, after a, what is his only his second ever start for us this season, I thought he played brilliantly. And like like OG was saying about the uh, his performance, I think he had nine tackles. He had the most number of tackles than any player on the pitch successful tackles and I think it was it was actually brilliant and Cthulhu to come off at half time I mean we've me and um, Mr Davies have always been a bit harsh on Cthulhu but it, there was talk about that he was ill and he threw up at half time which is why they took him off it wasn't a a, a Mourinho kind of uh, um, teaching a player a lesson taking off at half time which I think is really important to to point out because Cthulhu has been quite good lately I mean he's had a couple of man of the matches he's had some really good um, stats but yeah I think the whole game would have been differently if uh, was it Giroud had that chance right at the beginning of the game yeah, yeah so, I think that the whole game would well, obviously going to be different if they scored but uh, I think that it seems to me that Giroud either has a good game or a bad game and he, I think this is one of his bad ones here's a quick oh, one if you God. take sorry sorry if you take That's out right. if you take out maybe Ozzy and Chet who is your man of the match because that's one thing I've not been able to put my finger on I think maybe Monreal but I'm not who, who would because I thought Sanchez had a very poor game by his standards he yeah, was quite knackered you know, Giroud looked knackered. Tabushi was okay, but I thought, you know, his, his pace isn't there. Mertesacker... I thought Giroud was absolute shit that game, to be honest with you. He just yeah. looked fucking... He didn't even look like a footballer, did he? He, he, was, he was just more... arms and legs. Yeah, he was more focused on, you know, fighting with Vuitton. You know, at one point, he's knocked Vuitton into the ground. Vuitton has grabbed him by the nuts. and It's just a sideshow. I, I think Mertesacker wasn't at fault for the goal, per se. That was more Koscielny. But Mertesacker still, you know, had moments of madness where he's panicking on the ball, making poor tackles. Coquelin wasn't his. He was good, but not not quite his usual standard. Um, yeah, I mean, Ozil again played very well, and as you said, he's been consistent. But it's hard to really say who 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 would have been man of the I'd, match. I'd give it to I'd give it to Czech. He kept us in the game. Yeah, you, said you can't have Czech, didn't you? I, don't, hey? I did, but yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you said I just you can't have Czech or Ozil. Apart from that, who who would have? Oh, see, sorry. Team? Well, no, there's no one. You don't. Have, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sometimes you don't give a man of the match. But if I mean, if there was one overall, you'd give it to Czech. Uh, but I mean, you know, going back to what Damis Danny said about Debussy, you know, I'm quite happy that he defended him because um, I think early on people said that he was a bit petulant and stuff about his, his position in the squad now, and, and uh, I feel a little bit sorry for him because no one could have realised how fast Bellerin has progressed uh, in that squad over the last 12 to 18 months. And when, when Debussy first joined the club, I mean, everyone was behind him. He did he did he did a bloody good job. And he did really well. Um, and so he's probably a little bit shocked in some ways that he's been displaced by a young kid who has, who is on his way to becoming a world-class player. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can probably understand the petulance and I can probably understand why he thinks he wants to go, go on in January because he wants to protect his uh, place in the, in the French team. So, yeah, I'd, 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 still, I'd still back him just like Danny said. He, he, he did all right. Isn't it true? Before we move on, on the right back, isn't it true that Hector Bellerin can run 40 metres quicker than Usain Bolt? Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That's a, fa- that's a fact as well. That's that is a is. fact. You've heard it here first, listeners. That's and, a, a Burkham Wonderland opening Another fact, fact as well is that I don't know if any of you saw, but uh, Mesa Ozil did an interview with Arsenal TV, not, not the shit one, the actual proper one, um, and he actually said that he's been stopping for a few hours after training sessions to improve his finishing. Um, I don't know what you make of that. Um, Mesut Ozil surely becomes a complete player if, he's, if he scores 15, 20 goals a season, doesn't he, Raj? He does as well. And, and the other thing was, going back to what, you know, Giroud missed three headers on, on Sunday. And, and that's, that's the player he is. He does miss chances. We all, I mean, I accept it. I don't piss a whinge about it. But a lot of people had, once again had a go at him on social media on Sunday night. But my question is that there was an argument in the podcast a few months ago that when I was worried about we didn't buy a centre forward or we didn't buy a striker and stuff, I was told by various people, don't worry, you know, the goals will come from all over the park. And yet, that's my worry at the moment. We, we, we were expecting Giroud to score the goals at the moment because he's had such a good spell in the last few games. But there are, I mean, Cazorla hasn't scored since February, has he, in the Premier League. Uh, Ozil hasn't scored that many goals. So that argument that goals will come from, the, from everywhere else, well, it's not happening, is it? No. I would say the thing that to be to be concerned about would be Alexis looks like he's off off 
off the boil. And, you know, looking back at the season, we really, we were creating a lot of chances early in the season, but we were not coming anywhere near finishing them. And we seemed to kickstart our season, uh, I think around the Leicester game. And, and it's no coincidence that's when Alexis started scoring. And then, and now he's in a period now where he hasn't scored in a few games. Um, and Walcott's injured. Walcott was sort of carrying the load a little bit. I think that's probably a, a big worry, Raj, that, um, you know, if you talk about the goals coming from somewhere, those are the two probably most likely sources if you're not, um, if you're, if you're not talking about Giroud. Uh, and so I, that, that is a concern because, you know, Ozil can, can create a ton of chances. Um, but if there's no one there uh, to finish those chances, then, then potentially we can be in trouble. You know, on the flip side, though, I would say a lot has been made um, in the media about uh, Manchester United and Tottenham's defensive record. Um, and to be honest, Man United have been extremely defensive this year. Um, they've only conceded eight goals, uh, but uh, but we've only conceded nine along with City and Tottenham have conceded 10. So um, from that perspective, at least we're keeping them out. And that tends to be... Um, that tends to be more of a predictor of league position than goal scored. But I do hear you, Raj. I think probably it's, it's kind of concerning now that for me, that Alexis looks like he's a little bit off, off, um, off, off of his game. And, and Walcott looks like he'll be out for a little bit longer. Mm, that's not good at all. So we'll uh, talk about some of the games coming up as well. And uh, I'll just chuck that in there before we do move on to some questions. Um, the next games we've got up uh, West Brom away. Uh, Norwich away, Sunderland at home, Villa away, Man City at home and Southampton away. Now, uh, how many points do you think we can pick up from those fixtures? Six games there, um, and I'll go to each of you. Or How many points do you think we need to stay up there in the league or to a challenge, Danny? As in from from what period of time and over how many games? Over our next six games. Uh, West Brom away, Norwich away, Sunderland home, Villa away, City home and uh, Southampton I think the only, away. Yeah, the only one we're going to struggle with is, is City. Um, we're definitely going to, we should beat West Brom because they're nothing special. Norwich and Sunderland, that should be a rollover. Villa, as much as Remy Gard is going to turn things around there eventually by just defending. Um, I think the only one we've got to worry about is Man City at home and then probably Southampton away. So well, that's you, all over the busy Christmas period. Would you say it's us. feasible that we could win every single game there? Nope. No? No, definitely not. No, no it's, it's feasible, Danny, isn't it? It's, it's possible. It's well, possible. Not, it depends on how, the injuries and, yeah. and whether, whether now that Giroud is back, because he's the only player we've got, whether he's going to play every single game, because I think that we saw the best of Giroud when he was angry because he wasn't number one. Yeah. And yeah. Then when he was getting his punch in the floor and he's screaming at the fans, yeah, waving really. his arms, come on. But if, if Wenger just goes, oh, you're my number one again, he'll just carry on doing the... the just not doing his job and I think when when Theo comes back Theo needs to start a couple of games because I think we played better with Theo not scoring than we played with Giroud when Giroud wasn't scoring Mm, I, I the think the pace it... of Theo was scary. I mean, look, look at Bayern; they shit their pants. They they changed their entire formation and took two players off at half time because of what Theo did to him in one half it, it, it's also the the having to start with Walcott and using his pace tiring the defenders out, chuck Giroud on and, and then playing some long balls. It's two completely different types of football. Um, and it's almost having like a plan B with having Giroud there. Um, it's, it's been nice. And I, I will say as well, uh, I criticised on, on social media the fact that maybe the players in the first half, they didn't look up for it or they, they maybe didn't understand what a, a North London derby meant for the for the actual fans, but Giroud, I, I think he gets it. Um, you know, like Danny said there, you saw him geeing up the crowd and the fact that, you know, when he was missing those headers, he was punching the ground. Um, but unfortunately, um, on the flip side of that, we saw the Giroud that we saw in Zagreb. Um, you know, uh, again, to use the word petulant, bit childish, you know. Um, so there are two sides of his game. Um, but yeah, just overall, it was nice to see the passion. Um, we'll move on then. And Danny, we have uh, an abundance of Twitter questions, don't we? He's dead. He's gone. I, yeah, we've got loads. I was just um, scrolling through them. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, we have more of a statement from Hoppy Hopkins. How how long do you find yourself laughing, laughing at Chelsea a day? I'm currently at 22 hours. I even wake up laughing. So I thought that was quite a funny one we'll add in. I've got um, a picture of uh, Cesc Fabregas next to my bed that I wake up every morning and just piss myself with laughter. Because you know you're doing better than he is. And I did see one of the questions: Would we take Fabregas back for ten, fifteen million? No, not a chance. Wouldn't have him. No, 
Maybe, uh, maybe set him no. go back to to. Spain. Oh, can, can you imagine if they got relegated? I know it's that never going to happen, but I do imagine what would I be like if they got relegated? Can you, I would laugh. There's so much banter. I mean, there's just gags galore. Did you see the? It, the go on. No, I'll just say that every week, you know, I think like, this is the week where they'll turn it around and, and start playing and go on a seven-game unbeaten run. He's never uh, lost seven in the season, has no, he? No, and he's, he's, you know, I thought oh, they would definitely beat Stoke, and, and they they beat him. And it's just. It's brilliant. It's just the best thing I've ever seen. You know, it is. It's just the uh, in an implosion. I mean, they're just falling inwards, and I don't know what's going on. But well, it's it's laughable that their fans genuinely believe they've they've been hard done by by refs all season. As I do, do you not remember the game against Arsenal at the at Sanford Bridge when hmm. when Costa should have been sent off at and, least twice? Well, the, and what and the? the fact that Mourinho has just totally lost his shit. He looks absolutely clueless. And, and the latest one this week is as well, because he was in contact with the uh, staff on the side of the pitch via Twitter, he, um, he might actually get another ban because that breaks the ban that he already had. So, um, fantastic. Ross, did you see the tweet that I did a few days ago about the, the, the average points that when Chelsea got relegated? Because unlike Arsenal, they've been relegated six times from 1910 all the way through to the last time in 87, 88. I remember right. that. And the when they got relegated in 87, 88, they were averaging 1.05 points per game. They're currently managing 0.91 points per game. It's unbelievable, you, isn't it? It's, it's fantastic. I mean, so you talk, you're talking, look at that team. I mean, they are, they have got world-class players in it. And, Something. I mean, they've they've obviously lost faith in. They must have lost faith in in Mourinho. I think when Courtois comes back, it'll be a different story. Uh, uh, say, that's, that's the other thing. They sold check to us. They, <laughs> sold, want... they, they, they actually said, "Yeah, you can have him for ten million." I, I don't want to bang. On... I said, "Yeah, I love that." Thank you. Thanks very much. I don't want to bang on about it too much, but just looking at the league table, when they when Chelsea fans are talking about refereeing decisions, right? That game again, they're on eleven points now. In theory, okay, they could say they got a draw, but. Gabriel gets an off, Costa doesn't. Just say Arsenal win that game. Chelsea are then down on eight points, the same number of points that Bournemouth have. And if you look in the refereeing decisions, Bournemouth were hard done by so much against Liverpool at the start of the season. Yeah, they should when, have won it 1 0, not lost yeah, 1 0. Yeah, so Benteke had that goal. So in theory, you know, if Chelsea, if it was down to refereeing, Chelsea could be in the fucking relegation zone on the same, if not fewer, points than Bournemouth if it wasn't for ref cock ups. I, I, I do hear that. Incredible. Uh, since uh, Arsene Wenger has kind of turned it around at Arsenal and, and the fans are maybe have a bit more belief in him that uh, Jeff Arsenal feels his work is done here. Um, <laughs> he's going to change his Twitter name to Jeff Chelsea and uh, he's taken on a new challenge in Jose Mourinho. Um, really pushing the boat out with that one. Uh, I think he's got quite a challenge on his hands. Je- Jeff's, Jeff's name is changing it to fake taxi Jeff. Oh, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you afterwards why. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I was on about the Ladies' Cup earlier. I've been talking to Ava, and she says, you know, I said that it was called the Continental Cup. I thought that meant Continental, as in it is in the continent. It's not. That's just the sponsors. It's their League Cup. That's what we won, the League Cup. Continental Tyres. Yes, I didn't know that. So thanks to Ava for sorting it out. Not it County, 3 0 win, 1st of November. Thank you very much. Lovely, jubbly. Right, um, on to some more questions. From Jimmy R. Do you think the current set of players feel the significance of the North London derby like the teams of the 90s and the early noughties did? Say that again, what was the question again, sorry? Do you think the uh, the current Arsenal side yeah. and set of players feel the significance of the North London derby like the teams of the um, 90s and noughties did? No, some of them, but not all of them. No, I, I agree. Jack, I think... yes. Theo, yes. Gibbs, yes. Giroud, yes. Uh, others, probably not. I think Czech gets a bit of it because it, being a Chelsea yeah, player, yeah, he, he probably yeah. hated them like most people do. Yeah. Oh, I think maybe okay. Theo. We, I, I'll give a nod to Theo with his little 2 no, two nothing antics on the stretcher a couple of years back. <laughs> you, know, you know, it was in the old days, though, the, the, if a new player came into the squad, the squad would teach them. Uh, mm. It was a squad. It was the players that taught the new player how important that game is. And it's, it wasn't down to the management or the club or whatever. Um, but I don't think that happens anymore. Flamini you know, maybe, gets I don't know if you mentioned Yeah, Flamini, Flamini, gets, Flamini it. gets it and Jack probably gets it. But, Jack you know, definitely does. He's not he in you know. But That's my most important game at home of the season. The league, in the Premier League at home to Spurs. That's the one game of the season you cannot lose. Or any if competition. Do, any competition that we play Spurs against. Uh, I, I just league don't want to Cup lose. doesn't really count. Like when we yeah, but you don't want to lose them. You don't want to no, lose. No, we never want to. Yeah. No. So you fucking if we if we'd have lost that game on Saturday, I'd have been anonymous for a month. I can't do it. It's it's, it's like 
just it's inconceivable to think that we'd lose to them. I, I remember last year when they beat us at their gaff, that Harry Kane header. I fucking I was living. I felt hollow inside. How does he keep doing it though against us? I mean, that, is, hasn't he got something like ten goals in twelve games against us? Arsenal fans, yes, slagging, because... Arsenal fans have a go at him all the time. He's actually a decent striker. He's so. a cunt. Right. No, he's a decent, he's a, he's a decent striker. You can't just because he's Tottenham. You Fucking can't say. Fucking big chin tosser, Bruce Forsyth looking motherfucker. <laughs> he may well be, but he scores goals. He scores he's a very, goals. very good player. Yeah. Very good player. I'm not going to say that. Well, I'm he not does, you don't have to say. You don't have to admit it. But uh, no, an Arsenal fan probably won't admit it. But that's that's the truth. He's okay, next player. one from La Flama Blanca. Which member of the Invincibles would you have as manager if Arsene Wenger left tomorrow? Ooh, just just tell me anyone come up with an answer. Ooh. It's a tough one. I mean, you've got to look at the likes of Vieira, who's been touted as a future Premier League manager. Tony New Adams. York City, and he's gone this week. Tony Adams wasn't an invincible. Who's gone to New York City? Vieira. Patrick Vieira, Vieira. the new he's manager because... of New York oh, City. Yeah, that's right. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. he got appointed about three days ago. Oh, yeah. there you go. I've been... Three-year contract, I think, he's got with them. So yeah, that's because Man City owned them, didn't they? Yeah. So he's still yeah. a Man City person. They're just making sure that no one else gets him. I'd like to see Tony Adams giving a go, but it's never going to happen because, I mean, it was almost not too bad with Portsmouth when they were in the Premier League. And Lau- just... I'm going to go Lauren because I think <laughs> Lauren would have absolutely, any performances like that, do you think Do you think Lauren would have let him get away with that first half performance against Tottenham? I well, think I... he'd have ripped him a new arsehole at half time. Oh, I could top that one. How about Oleg Lushny, the horse? Yes. <laughs> no matter what you say, he does. You tell him to do. You, you do it because he's, otherwise you're going to end up in the gulag. Lusny in the gulags. Lusny wasn't invincible, though, was he? Oh, can't be invincibles, isn't it? I'm just yeah. thinking of mental Arsenal players. I think you missed out by one. Jens Lehman. 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 Lehman's brilliant. What did you say, Jeff? Howling mad Lehman. Yens. Oh, I said, you said it at the same time I was saying it. Mad Yens. One. Fucking imagine that. He'd just go and chin the opposite, opposite manager. <laughs> Ashley Ashley Cole needs a job. What about Burkamp? Have Roma let him go? There you go, there's a job for him. Isn't isn't Ashley Cole Roma anymore? I think he's a free agent. Ah, I wouldn't be surprised. So. Anyway, so, are we, we all done on that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is an interesting one from the entitled one. One moment in Arsenal history that you would change. For me, he says, it's Eduardo's leg break. I've already thought about this, so while I give you my answer, you're not going to be thinking it's going to be uh, Mad Yen's getting sent off in the Champions League final, because if he wouldn't have got sent off, we'd have won that. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Champions League final. Have, have I ever mentioned I was there? No. Oh, haven't I told you? No. Oh, I don't yes. go on about stuff like that. <laughs> Anfield 89, though. We're short of Anfield 89 stories. Do I don't you know think any... I know anybody. No one was there for do that. Do we know anybody that has any good Anfield 89 stories? I don't think we do. And not apparently apparently any... 3.2 million Arsenal fans went to the uh, Anfield in 89. <laughs> I sat on my bed watching it with my mate who's a Liverpool fan and me old man. But unfortunately, no one of any relevance. <laughs> hey, I'm not, she won't be listening. Bless her. Who cares? I tell you, I tell you what, the Eduardo one is is a good one because that's the one that's really upset me. I mean, obviously it was sad to lose this 2006 final, but his leg break and what I thought he could contribute to the team in the in the in the following years if he hadn't broken his leg, and that's a tragedy. That's just it just completely kind of finished him off as a player. Yeah, people forget this for Zagreb without looking up. He got something like thirty-four goals in thirty-one games the season before. Yeah. Or the season before that, and he was only just come back, and I think he was on a great run of rut form. Yeah, so that's that's a, that's a real one that really mm-hmm. still bothers me. You got yeah. one, Jeff? Yeah. Well, those two stick with me a lot. I'll throw out a third one. It's it's not in the same category, but uh, losing to Real Zaragoza in the '95 Cup final, uh, in the way that we did. With semen chip from halfway, basically mm. by Naheem, that ex Spurs player, that was a low point for sure. I I did not enjoy that. Cried that night. Yeah, it was a bad one. Yeah, that was a bad one. Oh, it's, it's turned but, awfully sombre. I'm going to raise the mood. Would anyone but, like to see my ticket stub with Joe Mercer's signature on it, just so I can confirm to you that I've been supporting the club for over sixty years? <laughs> did you buy that on I mean, eBay? I did me. indeed. <laughs> how much, you, how much are you charging to see that? <laughs> um, the same as I'm charging for autographs, uh, ten pounds. I've decided that when I, when I go to the next game at Arsenal, I am gonna be giving the first ten people I meet a pound. <laughs> I, thought, I heard you were giving out kisses for fifty p. 
Well, I might do. I just just, just playing the game. But as I'm probably never going to go again, they can hold me to that. It's never oh. going to happen. I think like, game. for me, the moment I, I what hurt me the most was losing in the FA Cup final to Liverpool when we were robbed by the Scousers, Michael Owen, 2001 in Cardiff. I was yeah. there. Is yeah, that, that when was, that uh, Henshaw's uh, yeah. bloody handballed it on the line? He did. And the I, told, I think I've mentioned before in the pod, the linesman that didn't give it as a guy, his surname's Pike, Pikey. And he uh, he's from uh, he lives in Dorset, and we used to play against a football team. He then coached, and I've been giving him stick for years, wanker. Um, was just Lee Dixon running, breathing out of his ass though, when he's fucked. Yeah. Are you, are you, I mean, another another one, and it's not on the same length or level, but selling um, for me, selling Vieira, that was something that I wouldn't want to. Uh, I'd like to reverse. I think we sold him maybe two, three years too early, and that, I think that went on and had a huge effect. And we had a soft underbelly for far too long in the club. And it was kind of the, the beginning of the end of of the the Invincibles and that era and that crop of just world class players, and we've never seen a crop that good since. And that was with, for me the start. With Vieira the though, Andrew, that's a funny one because he was touted every single summer to go, and he just got fucked off with it by about the third or fourth year. Do you know what I mean? It was like, oh, he's going to Inter, he's going to AC Milan, or you know, he was always linked with moves away from the club, and it just gets a bit tedious, doesn't it? Really, it does. But he was also the best midfielder in the world. And sometimes you just have to bite your tongue and put up with it. And these players have egos. And, you know, the manager's got to be able to manage those egos and uh, and keep them. And, you know, he was our captain. He was, you know, his last contribution to Arsenal was winning us the FA Cup final. Um, you know, and he, he he was one of the last few warriors we had. That And he, you know, you're talking about players that understood the North London derby, you know. Vieira fucking loved the North London derby. You bet, I, I, yeah. And for see. years, so I didn't know that, but for years after, look at players who played in that position. We had Abue played that place, you know, Song, who can, you know, when, he, when we first went there, Lasana Diara played there. Then we sold Gilberto early, Flamini left. You know, it was a real problem for us that that position. And, yeah. you know, Vieira still did it. He still went to Inter Milan and, you know, won Scudettos. He went to Juventus. You know, he still played re- relatively well for another good couple of seasons. And I, and I wouldn't have liked to have sold him as early as we did. And I think that was a very significant period, a significant sale for the club, which then, you know, resulted in all the others then leaving in, in the next few years. Mm. I'd like to reverse that four-all draw against Tottenham back in 2008 as well. If I if I'd have wished, that's that's one as well. That was, I've never been so angry in my life. When we Chelsea six see... 0 that was the most angry I've been. No, I, we were four two up, and to just concede those two goals in the last minute, and Aaron Lennon, you know, and and most of the Tottenham fans had all pissed off by then as well because they thought they'd lost. And then two fuckers around the pitch. I've never been so angry in my life for a result like that. It was just, it was just awful. And, and to have Bentley score that forty yard. Oh as well, yeah, mighty, you know. So I'd like to reverse that. That's my my private wish, anyway. I think the loss at home, sorry, the loss in the Carling Cup final to Birmingham was a huge loss. Um, it, I know it's only the Carling Cup final, but at the time, the mental loss because it was such a young team which had been just on the cusp of you know winning and there's so much pressure. I think that might have even put us back a couple of years in terms of that winning mentality and, and that kind of togetherness. I, I really think that put us back. And the way we lost it as well, the fact that we were dominant for so much of the game and we just got dicked by a, a what was effectively a goalkeeping defensive error. Over Femi Martins, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, still, still only 21. To be fair, to be fair they, they battered us in the first 30 minutes. Lee Bowie was denied a stonewall penalty and he actually tore our midfield apart for, for large parts of the first half. But look, on the bright side, they also got relegated that year, so fuck them. Right, Danny, <laughs> let's move on. Um, from a... A B Guna. Has Ramsey's absence shown some of the non non obvious things that he does? Extra man in midfield helps with high press, etc. Oh, that's a good question. Anyone got an answer? I tell you we do miss his engine. I'm not I'm not uh totally convinced that we should be playing him out on the right, but where do you put put him? I mean he's obvious obviously got quality. But I I think we miss the fact that he when he steps on that pitch, he does not stop going till well after the game. Um, and I think that would have come in handy on the weekend. I think, um, especially against Spurs, that having him being able to go box to box, coming out on out wide, coming inside, um, and just keeping the ball moving would have been uh, a big a, a big adva- advantage. Um, so, so yeah, I th- I think sometimes we do miss him. Um, also, the we're sort of a weird, ba- weirdly balanced team when when he comes into the squad um, and. As I think we identified earlier in the pod, the right side right now, it just doesn't feel right with uh, with Campbell and Debushi. It just hasn't quite clicked. It doesn't seem to have quite clicked. So for me, I th- I, th- I think it has highlighted, uh, the, you know, we've we've been missing that engine that he brings. 
to the game. Anyone else want to tickle on that? No, he's, 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 he's it. spot on, and also the creativity he brings to the game as well. You know, he's he's he's, he's, into, he's intelligent, and he's got an eye for goal. Yes, there you go. And a bit of Welshness. We was now I'm getting now I'm getting a bit I'm getting a bit depressed now. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is an interesting one from uh, ABW Radio regular, as it seems the last two he's done. Carl, that London guy who is the world champion Monopoly player. I think he makes up the rules. Who, from the past, fringe players of the squad, he's put e.g. Ray and Gramandi, who who you would like in the squad today? Oh, oh I don't know. That's a tough one. I think it's got to be a utility player, maybe a Remy guard, because he was he could play absolutely anywhere. And they're going to maybe an, a younger Flamini. Ah, younger Flamini. Yeah. Well, I, I'd, take a, I'd take a younger last era. I think he uh, stop he, him from leaving. He went, yeah, he went a little too early. I mean, he's a bit His money though, he, wasn't he it? Now. He's, yeah, it, well, it was he wasn't playing much either, right? Um, so I think I maybe that's that's an answer from me. He's doing um, well at Marseille at the moment. He recently got an inform card. Did he I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, he certainly did. He he's did. doing brilliant there. Next thing you know, bloody um, Diaby will do get one there. Um, yeah, he's he's doing pretty well there. I think he had a year out without a club. And then, yeah, because we bought him from Chelsea for six million, then we sold him on to Portsmouth within six months for about eight million, and then they sold him to Real Madrid for about twenty million. Something along that. Was it? Wasn't there a, a newspaper headline that he was a secret jihadi or something like that? No, that was Louis Barmorte. Was it? Yeah, who's currently yeah. playing down in Fife and uh, Carpenters area, playing for some local team around there, jihadying it up. I think he mm. probably couldn't even spell it, let alone do it. I was having a conversation with the guy who's the new owner of the Ivy and Marleybone on Saturday night. He used to play football with Louis Bo- Louis Morte, I have you know. At what club? Uh no, some Portuguese club. He was banging on about all the Portuguese players he'd played with, like Figo and uh Rui Costa. And uh, I asked on I I brought up Louis Bomorte and he told oh. me he played with him, yeah. Wow. But Morte, death grip, isn't the, it? The wa- the one player I would snake death. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, the, the kind of there's a bit of a loose definition there on what a fringe player was because we talked about Grimondi and Ray, who both played a lot of times. I think at this time, I'd really like Sylvain Viltor. Uh, you know, he was he could play on the right and he could play up front. Oh, that's now, a hell of a shot. Two positions where we need to play. Was he now. fringe though? He was, was it? a reg- you played, he was played regular. He was, no, he wasn't yeah. that he regular. Was never, he, he wouldn't. Was. He wouldn't be a first team starter if you looked at what our strongest eleven was in the, his era. There, you know, he he played a lot of games because Burkham was getting older, but he wouldn't have been. You know, on the right, we would have had Lundberg ahead of him, and up front, we would have had Bergkamp and Henri ahead of him, just like Grimondi had players ahead of him. He was, re- he was record I'm signing at, at the time, though, wasn't he? 13 million. million. Yeah. Right. Right. Looking at his four seasons in the league, he played right, in those four seasons in all competitions, 47, 54, 54, and his last season, he only played 19. There you go. Not, not fringe. fringe do, not yeah, do fringe. Fringe. <laughs> three games fringe. Do it on his last season, then. Definitely. <laughs> we had no legs. How about Edu? <coughs> huh? Edu? Yeah, that, oh. that was a great one. He left, he went to Valencia, didn't he, and uh, broke his leg. He left too early. He could have been an absolutely fantastic player for us. Another one who went for money, but I don't think he was offered a contract because, uh, yeah, it wasn't, uh, Wenger wasn't going to offer him the contract that he wanted and they did, so he went there and I think he broke his leg straight away. Is that, anyone on, did so Raj on? say Nicholas Bentner? <laughs> <laughs> Would you consider a uh, Sleb? Uh, a fringe player. He, no. was, he was one that oh. I thought we let go too early. To be quite honest, and another one who regrets it. He actually said he, he come out in the press said he regretted moving. Now he was a regular left starter on the left one. He, he was meant to have replaced Perez. He was fantastic. I think he never pulled his socks. Yeah, up, though, I, I thought technically he was probably one of the best we've seen at Arsenal. Lab was underrated. Never he was broke probably out one of the most anything. underrated players we've we've ever had at Arsenal. Never knowingly brought broke out into anything more than a jog. <laughs> Andrew, do you, Andrew, do you think that um, Chambers will become a world class utility player? <laughs> I think he'll become a world class utility man working for someone, some power company, but yeah, in in utilities. British gas. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think he'll ever be a world class player for Arsenal, I'm afraid. There you go. Another question. Oh, did you have an answer for that, Jeff? Yeah, I said last, last, last oh, year. Oh, you did. Yes, I always forget who said what. Um, right, here's one that Gimli would love to answer from Dave Reagan. How long can we carry on with big pair? For me, I don't mean a, don't mean a big pair. I mean our big pair. Me? Yeah. Because um, I know you're a fan of him, of his late his abilities lately. So, no, I, I, t- I actually tweeted that I don't think 
you know, I don't think he makes the first eleven anymore, Dave and Angel. I got ripped apart for it. But for me, I think he's a bit of a liability. I think he's become a bit of a liability. Nobody can question his passion. However, there's been games this season where he has been shit. And from what I see from Gabriel and the way Gabriel has played this season, Chelsea aside, um, I, I think Gabriel has has played better than what Mertesacker has. For me, anyway. I think Raj is having trouble with his PJs. We better let him not answer this one. He's going to get some oh, fruit and nut. Oh, he knows how to make us jealous, doesn't he? Um, yes, Mister Mister Unpronounceable. <laughs> how do you What do you think about Per? Gotta be me. Um, <laughs> that's a controversial statement, Gimli. I I don't know if I agree. Um, you know what was interesting? He. I, when I watched him on the weekend, Harry Kane went and, and played quite close to him and made all of his runs off of him, which I thought um, was was somewhat intelligent without praising Harry Kane um, because there's been a lot of strikers that have actually started away from him and, and Pear's positional sense, he's let them come to him. And I think um, the more players, the more young, fast strikers figure that out, that it, they go close and play close to Pear. Um, and then make their runs away they uh, into the space that he's going to get uh, found out. But I still think he's he's a, a very good defender. Uh, I don't know if we're quite there yet. I I, I, I do think that Gabriel looks like the heir apparent in, in that position. He made me look pretty solid. Um, so I would say it's it's close, but maybe maybe not quite there for me yet. Anyone else got any wise words to say on this? Oh. No, nope. doesn't sound like it. Next. Quietness. Next question from Luca Kola Kola Kuli 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 Gusic Bok. Why did it take so long for so-called in quote marks experts to start appreciating Meza Ozil? Go on, uh, Fife. I, want, I bet you want to go on this. I want to go on you. Uh, Oi, why? Get your room. So, uh, why does it take experts to? To yeah. work at how Usually you... self-proclaimed experts, all the haters. Is Neil Ashton an expert though? I would, I would, the tag that if he was in the dictionary, there would just be a picture of him and the definition prick by it. <laughs> I think it just comes down to a traditional philosophy in English football whereby English players, the ones which we usually give the most credit to, are the ones who are seen to be. And I'm not sure if you've read um, uh, The Secret Football, actually, did a very good interview a couple of weeks ago with Gerard Houllier, who, who, who I do, usually is an opinion on football I do respect. But Houllier kind of spoke about this, um, what he saw in English players and what he loves and what French people love when they watch English football is that kind of the, the spirit of English players and the tenacity, and it's kind of a mental spirit, right? So, you know. You know, we love, like, rise to riches, Roy of the Rovers type players. So, you know, Steven Gerrard, he would t- he takes games by the scruff of the neck and he can win you games through, you know, through, through just sheer determination, through grit and that whole kind of rhetoric around bulldog spirit. And, and, that's, and that's the kind of, um, I guess that's the s- synonymous with English football. You know, English football has historically been a working class game, the root, you know, deep rooted by work, hard working, uh, working class people who you know had admired the shit, the you know, the, the grit and determination of, of the players on the pitch. And you know, we always hear you know rhetoric, as I mentioned, about you know players want it. You know, we we don't get annoyed. We get annoyed when it doesn't look like our players want it to win. You know, want to win as much as we do, or when they don't try to. And that's and that's why we kind of you know, people fall over themselves. The so players like JT, Scott Parker, Gerard, because you know that they will. You know, to, you know, to coin a terrible phrase, put their body on the line. And, and sometimes we, we we miss out on kind of the finer the finer points of football and, and some of the beautiful things. And you know, people say um, with with Ozil, you don't you don't understand what he's doing because you know. You're not, you know, he's the kind of player who you don't really see what he does, and I think maybe that's part in part of the part of the reasons down to the way in which a lot of English people have been taught to play the game. You just don't read, you don't see what he's doing because it's not something you've been accustomed to. You know, you, you've been accustomed to trying hard in areas and trying to win the ball first, as opposed to you know reading the game, as opposed to moving out of position for other pe- so other people can move into that position or to draw players out of position. He does a lot of very intelligent things, which you know. I know it's almost a cliche to say now, but we don't see or you don't see because you're not looking for that. You're looking for, you know, who's winning the first ball, who's winning the header, who's taking the most shots. And and it and it goes unnoticed. Um and until I think, you know, Arsenal fans have, you know, and, and the pundits have now seen that the stats are completely outweighing them, um, and outweighing the argument that he doesn't do enough, 
you know, they they didn't take notice. I, I think it is fair to say that in his first couple of seasons, Ozil wasn't consistent as much as he is now. You know, that there were times when I think he probably didn't play to his best ability in some of our bigger games. But I think that's, uh, you know, that's an, a criticism so you can lo- um, lobby and levy at all of the Arsenal players in the last couple of years. You know, we, we've seen some horrific big game defeats. But he seems to take the, the brunt of it because he's our, you know, he's our iconic man. He's our £42.5 million pound player. So it's easy to criticise him ahead of the rest because you need know, to work up winner. What's he doing? He should be leading by example. And that's not really his game. He doesn't. He's not there to take the game by the scruff of the neck. He's not Vieira. He's not Gerard. He is someone. He's an orchestrator. You know, he, he he's the Mozart in that midfield. And 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 I think it's quite right that people are now finally starting to appreciate him for what he is. I think now with Coquelin behind him, settled, it allows him to, you know to play in those those kind of yards just a bit further forward. Takes the pressure off him, and and, and with players around him like Sanchez. He's really starting to flourish, but I think you know it, we still we're still blighted in our punditry and and the punditry we listen to by players who just bang on about you know credentials which are which are antiquated and and probably laughed at by by many parts of European um, punditry. Um, but it is brilliant to see now that that he's um, been getting the um, getting the recognition he so deserves, and and as Gimli said, from Arsenal fans as well. You know, I just want to add something very brief to that. I just want to say, put in a different way. He's an introvert that plays in a league that favors extroverts. And uh, I think that, you know, when you think about it like that, he's reliant on the people around him. An extrovert's going to grab the scrap of a game and you're going to know it. And an introvert, it's he just goes about his business. It's quiet. Um, he's very, very good at what at what he does. Um, and yeah, I think that's I think that's really what it is. It's sort of saying what Fife said in a different way that that the Premier League favors extroverts. It favors that guy who's going to run around a lot and yell and scream and and score goals and and do all of that. And you know, you've got this guy whose subtle genius is just sort of gliding under the radar up until now. And he has improved over the last few seasons as well, but um you know, I think that's really what it is. Or oh, just play for Liverpool. Just play for Liverpool. Yeah, no matter how shit you are, they still think you're then coming the new Messiah, Coutinho. How overrated is he? He's just the next on the, the conveyor belt of players that are going to piss off from Liverpool as soon as the first offer comes. He's um, they've they've already uh, talked about Barcelona, haven't they? Uh, Neymar's already come out and said, "Oh yeah, cause they're childhood friends, aren't they, Coutinho and Neymar?" Um, and they played together a lot in the Brazilian youth teams. And uh, he actually said, "Oh yeah, I think Barcelona." will uh, definitely be in for Coutinho. So that's probably where it'll go. <laughs> uh, probably. Okay, how much time have we got? Anyone we've got being... we've got 10 minutes. Oh, okay. I've got Should a question. Go... Oh, go on, Rush. Hold on, eating some fruit and that. Oh, don't. How are your oh, PJs? Are they all right? No, I, I was trying to type Jap sign, not chip PJs. <laughs> Racist. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, anyway, um, Gerard PK in today's Daily Telegraph in a very good interview, actually, said that if Barcelona and Real Madrid uh, join the Premier League, they would not win in their first season. The would the panellists agree? Yes. I think they'd get absolutely mullered. They would just get beaten to within an inch of their life every week, week in, week out. And they'd eventually go home with their tails between their legs. And in the second season, they'd just buy all of our best players and then beat us at our own game. Gimli? Um... What would would Barcelona or Real Madrid come over and win first first year? He says they won't. He he suggests that Messi on a wet wet November night at the Britannia Stadium would would as Danny says would get kicked up the arse all night Short long. Short cross jumping up I've, and down the yeah. chest. It's, it's just bollocks, isn't it? I mean, Messi is the best as it stands, the best player in the world. You know. <laughs> He probably would struggle to adapt against English teams, but it's just the quality of him. It's just inconceivable to think that he's a natural-born winner, isn't he? Well, if he's dead, he isn't. Well, well, of course he's not. What about you, but, Andrew? I think he's being humble, and I think that Barcelona or Real Madrid would walk the Premier League, regardless yeah. of what year it is, personally. Well, in the first, in the first season. In the first I, think, season. I, think, I think so. I think you look at the damage they do against English teams in the Champions League, and yeah, it's a one-off game. If that's, if that's what they can do to the top clubs, I mean, what hope does Bournemouth or, or Newcastle or, dare I say, Chelsea have? 
thing is, you, you look at the passes that Barcelona put together, we're talking six to seven hundred passes a game. Tell me a Premier League team that even comes close to that. There isn't one. Well, would they get the favouritism from the referees that they get in Spain? <sighs> Probably not. Well, I think that's got quite well, a big bit to do with it. I think they let their football do the talking. I think they, like Andrew said, I think they piss the league every year. What about Jeff? I reckon he's right. I don't. I don't. Th- I think it would take a, a season to learn the league and learn the opposition, learn the different grounds. Um, Thirty-eight games is a long time, and you, you see it when foreign players come into the league. It takes some time to adapt. Now we're talking about the top, top quality players, but I, I reckon he's. I think he's right. I think um, it might take them a season to to adapt, and then I do think that we'd be in some serious trouble. But how would Celtic and Rangers do? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'd love to see that them playing in the conference. <laughs> oh, maybe Chelsea would be able to get a win then. Hey, hey. <laughs> lovely. Right, final question from Gregor Lesniak. A, eh? C, lovely. The way you Lesby. Tell them. Lesby are you what? are you preparing for the Europa League? <laughs> Gimli. Uh, why do you have to give this one to me? Um, am I preparing for the Europa League? No, I think it's still perfectly doable. Um, I have faith. Um, I think we, you know, that's what George Michael said. It's it's pretty much out of our hands, isn't it? Uh, you can't imagine that whatever team that Dor- uh, that Bayern put out, they aren't going to beat Olympiacos. So you know, I know it's it's in that in the hands of Bayern, but you know, I th- I, I still think we'll make it. I, st- I, st- I still think we can do it. So no, I'm not preparing for the Europa League, but you know. If if a shit hand is dealt and and that's the way we have to go, I will support the boys in it. And you know, maybe it's a bit of silverware we can win. When it comes to shitty hands, you know your stuff. FC FC fucking paper bag on a Thursday night, <laughs> lovely stuff. <laughs> Either that, or I'd like to get to the final and play fucking Tottenham, cunts. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably go to the couple of games. You know, a little. You know. Just, just, just out of curiosity to see how many people actually turn up. I mean, I don't go if I'm available and around, I'll go to the games. So, Mr. Five, I'll, do you remember going to UEFA Cup games back in the day? Because I know you did, Raj, and they were shit, weren't they? Yeah, but the, I mean, this is. A, I mean, we're talking about the Emirates now. And I, I, I would imagine there'll be no corporates. Club level will be empty. Platinum will be dead. <laughs> there won't be a giveaway. The tickets. They, they, no one's. No one's going to buy a box for for fifteen hundred pound or three thousand pound or whatever. <clears throat> For, for some Kazakhstani team. So. I mean, we, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're discussing this on, on... I mean, I've discussed it on, on Twitter a few times. I mean, I, I, we talk about tickets. And w- one thing that I noticed, one thing that you give the club credit for, they, they brought back the, the junior gunner section in, in the ground. And so you've got, um, you've got a, a section of the clock in now where there's a certain... I think there's 10,000 tickets a season. Go for £10 for juniors and, and their fathers or mothers, whoever accompanies them. But then, and then but I'm always worried that as a club, with our pricing strategy on tickets being so expensive that we're losing out or we're missing an entire generation of kind of fans probably aged 18 to 30, so people who are either at university, and this is something I've spoken with Tom about, you know, from, from, from our radio show, people who, you know, people either at university from 18 to 22 or people, you know, very young professionals in, in the infancy of their career, probably with the lowest amount of disposable income they've got from, from a wage, from a salary perspective, and yet it's going to be so hard for them to have a fund to buy tickets or season tickets for the club. Um, and because of that, we've got an older generation of fans in the ground, which is something we spoke about, and, and that's kind of hampering the um, the atmosphere in the ground. And, and the thing we're missing out on, this is the time when you can get fans most hooked. Like people like me, I've not got a wife, I've not kids. I can go to games because I'm pretty carefree and I can have a few beers and I've not got someone moaning at me. This is the time when you can hook people in. And you're so, fucking loaded. Uh, that's not true at all, listeners. Don't listen to him. I, I pay my. He borrowed a tenner off but, me yesterday, and I ain't ever seen but, that again. But, but you know what I mean. The, 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 we could use the uh, putting a positive spin on on the on the UEFA Cup. You can use it to uh, you know to try and bring back that generation of fans. So I know with League Cup games, basically in your season ticket, if you're a season ticket holder, you get 27 games. So you get your 19 uh, League Cup. Sorry, your 19 League games, and then the rest of it's made up of, for credits in Cup games, and that will be your Champions League or, or your or your FA Cup. Now it's not defined as far as I'm aware whether that includes UEFA Cup. But what I was saying is. What they should do, in my in my opinion, is if Arsenal go into the Europa League, refund the season ticket holders the credits which you've accrued from the UEFA Cup games, 
and then charge them back at, say, £10 or £15. Because if you don't do that, you can't make the rest of the ground cheaper. Because you can't say to a season ticket holder, we're going to charge you, I don't know, £45 on a Thursday night to go watch FC Carrier Bag at home and then say to someone who's not a season ticket holder, we're going to charge you £10 because that's, disc- that's discriminating your season ticket holders. But what you can do is refund them, the, refund them for the game, make them pay the £10 and take the difference off next season, off their season ticket or whatever. But then you will bring down the cost to get per, for the game, and you might forgo a bit of revenue. But let's use this to, you know, sell out the ground. Let's bring in those people, you know, the lower demographic earner fans in the in their infancy of their career, and let's make it a positive message. Let's bring, let's you know, let's fill out the stadium. Let's bring back, let's make sure we bring and you know, give the the core youth, you know, a platform to watch their club and and make something exciting. Because I think that would make for a much better atmosphere, and it's a much better story, really. And it'd be much better for the players to be playing in front. You know, we'd probably be young players playing in front of a full crowd a bit louder hungry for it and that them rather than having you know as Raj said no boxes I was at the Swansea game at home in the FA Cup uh, in the replay in 2013 on January because we drew with them to all their ground there, there was only about 35,000 people in the Emirates do you know how shit that is so I think that we could use this actually spin it around make it a positive and you know bring back our young fans and give them something to watch and something to cheer about Spot on. I'd make it a tenner, just like the League Cup games. Just tenner for every seat. Fill it out. Get the kids in. Families, the older guys, and all that. Because I, I remember the League Cup games when we're playing at home, and it's a tenner. The atmosphere is excellent, and it's just a whole new crowd coming in. So, yeah, it's, it's a real, it's a really good opportunity for the club to um, give something back to the fans if, if we get, get into the Europa League. So, um, cross. I mean, if it does happen, then that's what they should do, and um, you know, it'd be good for everyone. Do you know the last time we were in the UEFA Cup? It's a bit of a trick question because we got knocked out of the Champions League in 99-2000. Remember when we were playing at Wembley? V- yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, the last games that we, I was actually looking at that was that we played Lons, so I was and Werder Bremen, Deportivo La Coruña, and we played Nantes, and I was at all of those. And uh, oh. that, that's when we had Lee Dixon's testimonial halfway through the season in November. Was he out on day release? Everyone. Lee Dixon? No, Nantes. Hey, he certainly was. So, uh, yeah, that, I remember those games being incredibly boring. Then we went on to the final to lose to Galatasaray. Speaking of which, I, I think this podcast would be lesser for not talking about uh, Karen Benzema. Arsene knew, eh? Didn't he know? Fuck it, Arsene no. knows. That's you know, embarrassing. That's, that's the funniest tweet that I've seen this week. Is someone said, oh, I've got a copy of the Matthew Valbuena video. And it was a midget in the full yeah. France kit trying to climb on a bed and keep falling yeah, it's, off. it's brilliant. It's the that. fucking funniest thing I have said on Twitter. Is he, is so, he going down for that then, is he? You've got to it imagine so, yeah. The, yeah. It doesn't look good. The transcripts oh. are pretty telling. Mm. Yeah. He said he was doing it for a friend. He wasn't making any money. He was just trying to help him out. Yeah. His friend, is it Karim Zanati? Yeah, the, the full transcript was published in Le Quip this morning between his his phone call conversation between his, um, with Karim, his friend, um, which was regaling his how he told um, Vabuena, and and, it, and yeah, it's very very damning. But what I would say is Benzema's been at the heart of controversies before in France. Um, let's not forget he was at the heart of. Uh, um, a group of French players that were accused of having sex with underage prostitutes, and that and that was kind of uh, let let go before. So the French uh, judicial system uh, has you know has fallen and bowed to uh, French national players before. So I'm not mm-hmm. too sure what the outcome will be here, but but nonetheless the evidence is very damning against him, and he is a silly boy. He is a very very silly boy. Yeah, definitely. So you was that rich and that famous, you sometimes think the law is beyond you. Right, I know it certainly is for all of us on this podcast, yes. uh, and and I'm that, breaking the law now, and that's why I go out after uh, on a Thursday night and steal uh, cars um, and cheese. Which and law? Cheese. Which law are you breaking, Danny? Indecent exposure. Well, I'm sitting here completely naked, doing star jumps in front of the window. Crikey! Yes, it's not good. So f- fraud, then benefit cheat. Shh. Oh, okay. Money. Okay. Right. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on then. Um, and before we go, I'd like some predictions for West. Is it West Brom away? Uh, is there any point doing that when it's not? We haven't got the next game is going to be the 21st of November. And that's 10 days. A lot can happen between now and then. And all you twats are all going to change your predictions anyway. Yeah. I'm not. So I, want just... to know, I want to know what the team is first before I'll give my prediction. Yeah, so we might have three or four, but it might even have Jack back. When did this then. get so difficult? 
What? I just thought, oh, I want to see what the team is before we've, I make we've, a prediction. We've changed, we've changed things since you've been away, mate. What? So. Uh, you are a fucking diva. No. Uh, mate, him? No, yeah. I'm, I've, I've, I'm top, or I'm near top, so I, I want to well, stay I've there. I've updated it for the last ten games, and I've just got them all in the word for. <laughs> yeah, you're probably about third or fourth now. I know, me and Dom are bottom. It's not good. Love stuff. Anyway, return, return injury dates. On the 21st, they go game by game rather than actual day. It says, the Ox should be back, Ramsey should be back, um, Rasicki's funeral, um, Sonogo has been just abandoned. Who's opening um, sweets? Not me, I wish. Really? Um, you need Walcott to... You need Should to get back. an electronic lighter for the next time you're on. And Zellalem. Oh, that's Jan- oh, it says Zellalem's back on the 9th of January. Oh, I thought it was a season-long loan there. Oh, imagine him getting a go in the... Oh, not in the League Cup anymore, are we? They'll probably have um, a... If it's January, they'll probably get the chance to extend it, I'm sure. I'm trying to find... Uh, where is it? Jack Wilshire. Oh, it says unknown. The other day it said the 21st of uh, November. So Jack won't be back. Never mind. Could see him sideline until Christmas. And Danny Welbeck, we're just going to sell him to Sunderland, the graveyard of Man United players. Andrew, yeah. Andrew said, uh, let's rap. So they call me Gimli. They call me Simon. But that's not your name. No. And that is strange. That's, no, that's not, not my not name. name. No. No. Uh, shout outs then. Uh, I'm going to go first. Uh, my first shout out goes to my best mate, who is at Mark with a C, Alan Double L in the Allen, Hyatt, H-Y-A-T-T. Um, it was his birthday this week. He turned 30, you old fucker. So, um, 30? Yes. Uh, wow. A, a big nod to him. Um, my, thir- my 30 is still coming up, December. When is it? December 17th. Are you going to be grumpy? Oh, probably. I'll just go out and do some yeah. heroin or something. I don't know. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Good stuff. Not none of your blue stripe nonsense. No, no. Good. I, I, no, I'm good. either that or I'm just going to sit on the doorstep with some cider. Oh, do that. It's cheaper. Yeah, I'm glad. It's probably the way forward. I'll buy you a Sherlock Holmes hat and you can fit right in. Can I have a Tommy Cooper one? No. Fair enough. Um, right then, shout out. Uh, Danny, yours next. El Nobo. That's E L. K-N-O-B-B-O. I don't know who you are, but I was doing a Twitch last night of me doing Fallout 4, and he showed me, he told me how to do it so he could move all the furniture around and build new things because I couldn't figure it out. And he's an Arsenal fan, he's listened to the pod, and apparently he follows us, but I still don't know who he really is. So there you go, if you do listen to this, cheers, Governor. Mm. Uh, Raj? At Charl Henders, C-H-A-R-L-H-E-N-D-E-R-S, Charlotte Henderson, who... Is always on my time now, but she's a Sunderland supporter, but she's lovely, and you should follow her because she's quite a laugh as well. Mm. Commiserations. Wonderful. Don't go down. She's a mess. Uh, Jeff, uh, in tribute to you this week, I'm going to call it Shout Outs. Uh, Oots. Thank you. So, over to you. Shout out to at Ellis Mel, M-E-H-L. Uh, put out a cheeky hashtag a few weeks ago, and now look what's happened, Ellis, so uh, I blame you. Uh, and he'll know what that means. You're not uh, out of the duff again, you. are you? What's that? You up the duff with a unicorn? I am, yeah. I, I have got some uh, exciting up the duff news. Lucy, our black Labrador's pregnant again. Uh, is it by your other dog? Yes. Are they related? Theo. No, then they're, they're not like brother and sister. They're just lovers. Uh, just don't casual yeah, lovers. Don't, don't judge they're them. Just a pair of sluts. Seriously though, we put her out in the garden and he was he was he was mad on her for two days. I've never seen anything so grim in all my life. <laughs> oh, it was red bits everywhere. Um, yeah, uh, 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 we've done right. Andrew, oh, I've ruined. Uh, so, my shout out. I actually I don't know if any people, have been on t- uh, listeners are aware. I actually have a guy, who's a, he's probably the strangest guy on Twitter, and this is a very left field shout out. He, he stalks me, uh, and he stalks other people I've noticed. He's called Guna, and his, uh, and his uh, handle is at Arsenal 49 not out probably the strangest guy on Twitter he routinely tweets me after I've tweeted asking for uh, five year um, forecasts on oil futures or the price of copper or aluminium or random shit and he and he and he kind of seems to message similar odd odd questions to uh, to fans not sh- not sure he is from his bio, up the Arsenal and Iron Ore is in capital letters finished, but Pig Iron is in capital letters okay, and Colney is being redeveloped. Thanks for ready for reading. Yeah, and you should <laughs> you should just read some of his tweets. It is pure genius. 
And for some reason, at half eleven last night, he messaged me in, in a direct message, just saying "night, Andrew," at about half eleven. So I, I don't know if he if he's genuinely mental or if he's constantly on the wind up. But he seems to pick out certain people. So if I talk about finance and Arsenal finance, he'll just only tweet me about the most inane financial tweet stuff. He always tweets Mark Ganella, who's the director of Arsenal Communications, um, about random shit. Um, and it, it is actually quite funny. I don't take it offensively. But I would recommend you just read his... Uh, if you have a dark sense of humour, then read his timeline, because it is pretty hilarious. Sounds like a nutcase, Andrew. You should introduce him to Ginger. Did you get back to him by 8am like he demanded? <laughs> I mean, he routinely demands... Uh, he says, Andrew, and then he puts your at. Can you work out when the earliest we can have Lee wrapped up and drop me results by 8am, start of play tomorrow? Thanks. <laughs> Jesus. Speaking of nutcases, we've got another one um, on the podcast account. Uh, and uh, here's a nod to him. His name's Tim Lemon, uh, who is at Tman7891. And he so kindly tweeted us this morning at 20 to 5, um, just simply to say... Oh, and to make it clear, at the AFC <laughs> podcast, fuck you. You are all scum that would rather lose than win. Losers, the lot of you. So, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, big nod to you, you all fucking right. lemon. Can I just carry on my shout out that this, this is the tweet? <sighs> he just put Mo at Arsenal Mo. Can you tweet Giroud some support? You're the only one he listens to uh, a bit down after he misses and do an <laughs> AFT interview, thanks. And then he put. I think Giroud is really tough mentally and keeps bouncing back because of Mo's support. Our oh, Arsenal Mo, he gets behind him and Giroud listens in capitals. I'm going to go and follow him. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> going to follow actually. <laughs> it's Arsenal 49, not out. Oh, that's genius. Go and give him a follow and it'll brighten up. He's done 9,000 tweets of meaningless drivel. <laughs> and he only tweets about 10 people. Well, that's, <laughs> Danny, that's your toilet reading material for the next day. Oh... I've got one. I'm going to get a bag fitted, so I don't have to do any reading at all. It's Love easier. This. Can I wrap right, this is up? Anyone, is anyone going to interrupt him? Because he's just about to wrap it up. I was. I've still yeah. got to go down Tesco's and get beer. Oh, and cheese. I know. Right. I nick the cheese. Oh. So, that was a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And keep it Arsenal. Good night. Merry Christmas, everybody. It's not fucking Christmas. Sorry. Do they know it, though? No.